Is it really practical for small towns to talk about growth? You are listening to episode 68 of the Growing Small Towns show, where we chat today about the human capital component of small towns and why every single person in a small town needs to be seen, valued, and supported. And that's the growth that we're talking about. I'm Rebecca Undeman. While I'm typically the host of the show on today's episode, I get to be the guest. We are so excited to welcome as our guest host, Nicole Pond, founder of The Yellowbird, an amazing, incredible online company that offers safe and affordable skincare. And she happens to also be the president of the board of directors for Growing Small Towns. So Nicole comes on and she interviews me and we talk about the mission and the vision and basically the overarching journey of Growing Small Towns so far. And our hope is that we inspire every single one of you listening in your small town to know that, first of all, your ideas, your big ideas, small ideas, they have merit. And then secondly, that they can come true. You can put them into reality. Don't forget to snake this episode's Fast Five, which actually includes six questions because Nicole's a classic overachiever. She chose these random, super fun questions, and I got to answer them on the fly. And then also be sure to check out the show notes. We mentioned a lot of links. There's a lot of goodies to check out. We want to make sure you get all of that. We are so thrilled to welcome you. We hope you enjoy the episode. Hey, Nicole, I'm so excited. I'm so excited for me. I'm so excited for our listeners because they get a break from me leading this thing. And now the tables are turned and I'm the guest. Welcome to my show. You may, I may adopt you as an occasional co-host. I'm gladly. I'm here for that. Yeah. Um, so, hi, welcome to the new podcast. We're so yeah. happy you're here. Today, I will be interviewing <laughs> our founder and fearless leader, Rebecca Undem. My name is Nicole, by the way. All right, Rebecca, so tell us a little bit about yourself, where are you from, and all the things. Okay, so I'm from Oaks, North Dakota, a little farming village of about 1,800 people. I was born and raised here. I left to go to college. I went to the big city of Fargo, North Dakota. I went to NDSU, North Dakota State University. Go Bison, right? Met my husband there. I was there, like in total, we were there for a little more than a decade. And then we were in Montana for a hot little bit too. And then we we found ourselves coming back to Oaks, North Dakota. We've been back almost 12 years now, which is crazy. That's gone by really fast. But we moved back here for my husband, primarily for my husband, for Jeremiah, to farm with my dad. So I I grew up with, my dad was a farmer. He's a fourth generation of his family. And I had this older brother that had no interest. And it, there was a, a number of things that came to, to pass. Like I was in banking, which is really hard to even imagine because I was like good at it, but I just didn't love it. You know, like I just had that moment of like, this can't be what I'm, what I'm really going to do. It wasn't right for me. And so I was kind of having a crisis of like career conscience anyway. And my dad also had a seed company and just the stars aligned. My mom had a pumpkin patch. She was going to start that fall and she needed a lot of help. We made that really crazy decision. At the time, it sounded really crazy to come back. So we've been back for 12 years. And I was pregnant with our first child, unbeknownst to me, when we made that decision. So then then that kicked off like real life, right? Because now 12 years later, we've got three. So... And so it goes. I know. So, and so it goes. When you left Oaks the first time, did you ever think that you would be coming back and raising your family in your hometown? 100% no. I mean, I can say like, I feel like I never, I never said like, oh, I'm going to blow this popsicle stand. Like I'm too, this isn't good enough for me. I wasn't like, I didn't have that kind of negative outlook at all. Like I really loved growing up here. Right. I just... I honestly never pictured how I was going to find career fulfillment. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was really, I was really determined (laughs) and I was really, I hustled after stuff and I had like big ideas of what I thought my life was supposed to be. And let me just be clear about this too. It wasn't clear like what kind of a ladder I'd be climbing. I just anticipated like, I mean, I always joke like wearing a business suit, drinking overpriced coffee and carrying my briefcase full of some important papers. Like I was legitimately, it was like, you know, it was like that, that unclear, but I just, I didn't see how that would ever align with being in my, my small town. Okay. Well, would you also say like in the last 12 years and even in the last year, yeah, uh, when things have shifted so much, did you ever picture it to be possible now to do just about any job from anywhere? Yeah. 
Well, oh man, that's such, that's not a loaded question, but it is as far as like how much we've all learned, especially this last year. So, you know, I had the idea for Growing Small Towns, which we're going to talk about over a year ago. And I wanted to have a, a place in my community that we could have co-working, right? That we could, right. for people that work from home or did their own thing, could have a place to land or traveling salespeople that have Oaks as part of their territory would have a place to actually have meetings. And also as a, as a speaker. So, you know, and again, we we can get into this or come back to whatever. Most people that have heard the show know all of our new friends. Hi, everybody. But I was, you know, as a speaker and I'd go to small communities and nobody had like a plug and play setup for Mm -hmm. for training. And so I wanted this inspirational and innovative space in my small town. A year ago, co-working wasn't even something that made sense to one out of every two people, I would say that I spoke to and probably even, even less. Yeah, really understood it. And then COVID happened and suddenly everybody, we were forced into it, which is honestly, sometimes the only way we'll learn because we get pushed into places we didn't think we wanted to be. But yeah, I mean, that has been such a, it is such a cool thing to be able to say, and I'll say this too, North Dakota, we've got fiber internet. So like I talk to people all over the country and I do, I mean, I like through the podcast and stuff, everybody's internet is spottier than mine. Yeah. And so that's a really cool thing, right? Like it's a huge asset, yeah. an infrastructure asset for my, for our region, but you literally can, you can do anything. And yeah. it's something I couldn't have forecasted or, or thought possible. And I graduated from high school in 1999, like didn't have a cell phone in my hand. I turned 40 this year. This is a big year for me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like, I actually love that I'm part of the generation that has seeing this shift because I, I really feel like I appreciate it, even though technology can be really rough in a lot of ways too. When it comes to commerce and it comes to business and it comes to opportunity for people that want their kids to run freely in their community and not have the fears. And again, I never want to demonize urban centers. Let me just say that, like, that's not what this is about. It is about not demonizing one, but it's about truly celebrating small towns. Right. So I love that jumping into the growing small towns, I love that you have a goal um, that's right on your website that says creating space for people to grow. A lot of times when we hear growing small towns, you know, we think, oh, we're going to get an Old Navy, an Ulta, and a Dick's. Like, this is, <laughs> this is, this is it. <laughs> like, we're growing. Um, my, my dad would get, or Trader Joe's, man. That would be, that would be cool. I could get behind a Trader Joe's. <laughs> yeah, I could. Right? And a lot of times that's what we feel when you hear, like, our small town is growing. You think of more stores coming. You think of usually, like, more housing, more people. But the grow word in the yeah. name isn't used that way. How would you define that? Yeah, so perceptive of you. You're an excellent guest or host. Seriously, (laughs) you're going to have to come back and be my co-host. So this, again, I think what's what's cool about where I feel like I'm at right now is it literally feels like everything I've experienced professionally and just as a person has led me to wanting to do this work in a more obvious, like clear kind of way. And I think you know, when I got out of banking, I transitioned right into corporate development work. So where companies would hire me, you know, through the company I worked for, well, I can just say it, I worked for Dale Carnegie Training, right? And Dale Carnegie wrote like the infamous book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. All of that training was about helping people tap into their personal capacity, which then affects how we talk to each other. It affects how we communicate. It affects how we deal with conflict. It's harnessing and leveraging the talent that people inherently have, right? So at some point, I started to think to myself, how do we do that as a community? Like, you know, the last three years, I was our chamber president and sat on our economic development board. And every struggle that I feel like we have as a small town, it's only going to be answered through people. You know, and so what does creativity, what does innovation, what does thinking differently about the problems we have, what does that look like? And how do we do that? Well, it's it's about human capital. So growth to me is about the growth of who we individually are, because when you invest in yourself as a person, it affects everywhere you go and it affects everything you're involved with, right? Like mm-hmm. if I decide to learn how to speak 
let's just take a random example. Like if it comes to being more persuasive in the way that I talk, let's say I decide Mm -hmm. to take some sort of course on persuasive communication. That's going to help me as a parent to get my kids to eat their broccoli, right? Right. It's going to help me navigate the generational divide that's in my women's group at church. (laughs) If I'm on a, you know, if I'm on a committee or a a community group, it, it helps everywhere. And small town people, we tend to be pretty interconnected to lots of different things. And so I feel like if there was ever a time to just really go all in and invest in the people that are already here, this is the time. If we want to see things shift and change, like let's invest in the people. And you know what? When you look at your past, kind of like you said, like nothing in your past history was wasted whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And so you look at thinking, which is all about managing and investing and managing assets and investing assets. It's supposed to be growth, right? And then going into training. So learning how to teach people yeah. and then going into being a speaker where you actually get to, to practice this teaching and what's it like and how do people respond to now creating a space instead of to grow financial assets, right? And manage that right. in a banking capacity. You're doing that with you, I think you even said it, human capital, right? To where, you know, make your money work for you, right? Like, yeah, don't, Instead of just getting back, you know, 0.1%, like in your checking account, like if you just put your money in this different type of savings account, you'd be getting back 1.8%. Right. That's much brainer. So by investing in the people who are already in your town, it's like a no brainer investment for the value of your space. So I love that. I absolutely love it. And then in the middle there somewhere, you mentioned banking and training and speaking, yeah. Um, is there like a book about you? I wrote a book about me. Mm-hmm. I did. So my book is called How Mommy Got Her Groove Back. So what's funny about it is I will say in hindsight, I should have titled it differently probably because it's, it's not necessarily about motherhood in and of itself, but it's about me standing in the middle of the chaos that ensues with motherhood and moving back to my small town at the same time. And just, again, kind of that journey of trying to find my way back to my professional self in the midst of now having babies too. Right. Because I am not, and never have been one of those women that ever expected that I'd stay home with my kids like full time. I just feel like I've got an ambition that needs to be fed somehow differently. Right. And so again, I don't even think I need to say it, but it's no judgment to people that make that choice. It's just, I knew I was going to also need some professional or career aspirations alongside. And then again, here I am in a small town, like, how do I make this work? So that's what How Mommy Got Her Group Back is all about. And it's been for women that move back to small towns. I think most of them see themselves at least in peace through what I talk about. I talk a lot about family. Family was a huge reason that coming back here has been the biggest blessing of our lives, honestly, and also continues to be very challenging. I mean, absolutely. you know, that's just what family is. And yet it's this richness that I wouldn't trade for anything. Yes. Okay. Speaking of blessings and value at growing small towns you have i love this defined values for those of you who have not been on the website I yeah which by the way let's plug the website like go check it out friends check out the website there's some really good graphics i'm not gonna describe them here yeah you gotta check it out to see them yeah they're super good but the values are you grow your own mm-hmm. you honor the past you look ahead you celebrate differences you try new things and you work together. Can you tell us all about, speaking of trying new things, your journey, right? You've had to kind of live out these values with growing small towns. 100%. A nonprofit, mm-hmm. starting a company LLC, learning how to, I don't want to spoil all the secrets. You had to learn so many new things. Can you tell us a little bit or a lot of it? Yeah. Um, the journey from where the idea you said a year ago, you had this vision, right? Yeah. yeah about it was, like open- May. it was like May of 19. So it's open over a year now okay. where I was really getting kind of serious about talking about it. Yeah. The vision for growing small towns mm-hmm. and kind of what you thought. And I think one of my favorite parts, well, one of my favorite parts of being friends with Rebecca is getting to to see the iterations in real time, which I, it's more stressful, probably especially for you, Rebecca, because it's literally happening to you. Right. <laughs> Watching of what you thought it was going to look like and mm-hmm. how things did work out, didn't work out. And then where you are now that we're actually launching. Yeah. Um, 
And that way people can see and not just dismiss like, well, of course, Rebecca, Rebecca Unum did this huge, amazing thing because she's visionary and she just does stuff. Like walk us through some of that progression. Yeah. That wasn't as linear as you thought it would be. Yeah. It wasn't at all. I mean, at all at all. <laughs> and I, and I think like, so I, I call 2020, like it's a banner year. It's mm-hmm. been a crazy year, but some of the things that are going to land this year, like are pretty amazing. And I think no matter what, there's blessings and all of it. So Mm -hmm. for me, I am pretty type A and perfectionism has gotten in the way of a lot of things getting started because I just want to do it right. And I just want to do it well. And let's be real. Like if I could do it, let's just do it perfectly. Like that would be ideal. I had this idea, this building that I love so much. I've talked about the building. My grandparents ran a Ben Franklin store from this building when I was a little girl, my mom worked there. She had a whole department that she ran and like, I just have visceral, strong memories of what that building was like, you know, watching my grandpa, first of all, like make popcorn in the morning and clean out the popcorn machine. And then he'd vacuum. And then my grandma did bills in the back office and just like all the things about being a little kid and walking up to the building after school, those memories, it's like this building has always had a hold on me, but I never, I never was like, I should buy it. That never like ever (laughs) occurred to my brain. But then I start thinking, gosh, like what if we could use that building and turn it into this space and where I could host programming like I already do? Could this building, if done well and right, like in terms of renovation, could it support the work I already do, but in a more meaningful way in my hometown, you know? But I mean, that's just it, like desire and even passion and good enthusiasm is just, it's not enough. Like, right. I think it's super <laughs> important, that. right? The the belief and the hope and the, I, I think that's something that's overlooked. I think too often we're like, what does the data say? What does the data say? And we forget about the hope. I think hope is a really grounding thing. Like you have to really have that belief that not only is the future bright for my community, but I'm going to help make it brighter as long as yeah. I'm here, Right. Okay. So had all of that, like got all the hope. (laughs) Got all the faith, faith that you could do it. The hope is in spades. Like we're good. But then, so the building at the time, it had previously been a consignment store. And then that program kind of went away and there was a hair salon in the front corner of the building. That was the only active business like regular business in the building was this little corner salon. How big is this business for us who haven't been to Oaks? The building? Yeah. It's about a 7,000 square foot building. So it's big, right? It's a big, it's a big old building. Yep. Right, right in the heart of Main Street. And it's flanked on both sides by existing businesses. And it's open down on the bottom with like a half upper level. Yeah. So there's a, there's a balcony on the back, on the back part, maybe like the back quarter of the building and otherwise it's floor to ceiling two-story ceilings like the original tin ceiling is still in the building and stuff like that so yeah it's really cool but it hasn't been updated like the major systems haven't been updated for decades probably since I mean since the 90s at best I would say okay so there's there's this building it was for sale so I start kind of you know like tiptoeing through all of these things this was like the middle of last year And I talked to the building owner and then she gets a competing offer. So this was in September. She had somebody that wanted to buy the building. And I had just started to like baseline figure out what maybe we could do. Like I was nowhere near ready. Because I think that's the other thing. I'll just say this for everybody in my community. They were like, what are you doing? Why why isn't anything happening with that building? It's like, it wasn't just buying the building because the building was priced really reasonably, to be honest, for the amount of square footage. It was getting some semblance of an idea of what the, all the renovations were going to cost, right? And then you have to you have to have a business plan in place, like what kind of revenue projections, or in this case, as a nonprofit, what kind of annual fundraising, or are there grants? All of the sources of potential funding that you could possibly imagine but you can't do that without a plan. And then you can't do that without bids. So I was completely overwhelmed. And the amazing thing at the time was I had already presented this to the economic development group that I was on the board at the time. And they were really excited about what it could potentially mean for our community. So they purchased the building. Now I'm going to say this because if people in my community are listening to this, I don't want them to think that it was purchased for me. 
Okay. Technically it was for the idea, but they didn't like donate the building to me or anything like that. It was always, the plan was always that, you know, when I got all of those pieces, because the pieces just take forever to pull together. I mean, and it's not, like, you had to like, not only get bids and stuff, you had to start a nonprofit. Yeah, exactly. You learn how to start the, a nonprofit. The legal, <laughs> the legal structure and all of it. Yeah. It was, it was just so much. And uh, community development people, a lot of people like contacts that I have, it's funny. I wouldn't necessarily say like, if I were you, I would do what I did. I wouldn't say that to people necessarily. Like, you know, this whole thing, I was like, what's the minimum viable product for this business? I thought about that a lot. And you and I were in a mastermind together. We talked about it. Like, how do you step into it gently? I still feel like the building needed so much attention that I'm not sure we could have, like there weren't even, they're not even solid restroom facilities. Right. So like, what are you going to, what are you going to do? Like, how are you going to step into this? So, right. so anyway, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Part of this is my personality. I mean, I'll admit that it's just like, again, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to actually do it. So I think they actually took ownership of the building in January of this year. And I had two major events scheduled. Well, actually three where I was going to do the majority of my fundraising and get into that building by midsummer. And then COVID happened. Yeah, for everybody, right? And I just, I will say that the brakes, I mean, it was like, you've ever heard the air brakes on a semi? (laughs) That's what it felt like, just, you know, like, and we're stopped on the middle of the interstate, like, shoot, you know, it was really, really hard. That was probably the most trying time during that. And yet I said to myself, like, the mission of this organization is still valid. What I want to accomplish is still, it's still viable. I just have to maybe approach it differently. And through that period of time, I secured a couple of larger partners in, in organizations. And then just this, like two weeks ago, now we got the final bids in so that we could do the projections and the appraisal came back in high enough where it needed to. And we've signed the purchase agreement to buy the building. Oh my gosh. And Yeah. Thanks. And going back to our economic development group, they've been extremely patient. Like they've honestly been so good to me and it wasn't at all how I wanted it to go. But there again, if you want to find it, you're going to find the blessings and you're going to find those things like, oh my gosh, that actually worked out way better than if I had gotten it the way I wanted it. Like I just, I believe in divine timing. Right. So I feel like I'm right on schedule. (laughs) No, like we're right where we're supposed to be. Well, and like you mentioned before, like pre-COVID, I remember when we were talking about it and we were talking about doing this beautiful co-working space and the vision was like, we either want arts integration and training potential and a Mm co-working space. And then Mm -hmm. once you talked to the people in your community, you came back to us and you were like, okay, so I want co-working space, but there might be five other people in my town who also want it. Mm -hmm. They're not, you know, this isn't what our people need right now. So it was one of those things that's like, How can we love the people in our community where they are now right? and not make it something that you're angry about or even like trying to force and just saying like down the road, this would be really relevant. Right. That road was a lot shorter because COVID was that road. And now all of a sudden people are like, I want a place to live. Like COVID brought out all kinds of things in different people. But, you know, I feel like the importance of family and especially like proximity to family became Mm -hmm. more of a priority and good internet, truly. Come to North Dakota. We have space and fiber. That should be the poster. I mean, it's convincing. Right, right. Like, it's totally and, true. And that was already perfectly foreordained, laid out for you. Mm-hmm. And now you were already in the process of getting this building and stuff. And so now, like, you actually might get to kind of circle back around to your closer to original vision. Yeah. Right? What your community really needs. Right. Um, that is the coolest thing ever. So. The building, the building is happening. What's is. next? Oh, you just signed the purchase order. Mm-hmm. Yep. What's next? Well, what will happen now? Hopefully we'll close and be into the building sometime in November is, is I think the timeline. Okay. And now I get to go back to a lot of the people in the community that I had talked to and talk about what support for this, the programs and the services and the, and the build out can look like. That was something I've had. I'll just say this for anybody trying to eat an elephant, right? Which is the thing. Do you remember, Nicole, when I had 
a poster up right back there that had the little boxes on it. And all I, I was keeping track of how many conversations I had with people. Yes. And we talked it, it was, you know, sowing seeds. So we like yeah. stuck with the growing and then the, the harvest and the planting. Were there stickers at one point? I had stickers. Yep. I had little smiley face stickers. So I had this little chart where every day my job was just to put the name of somebody new in one of the boxes and then add a sticker, (laughs) which sounds super silly, but it wasn't at all because it kept me focused on the only thing I could do, which was sharing the vision. And with as many people and constituents as I possibly could, there were over 100 boxes and I filled out almost every single one of them. Now that doesn't sound maybe that incredible, but I'm a mom. I was like teaching the kids at home then. We couldn't go anywhere during COVID. I mean, it was, we still made tremendous progress, but it was just sharing the message. Um, So that's something to like, I think what I tend to do is I ruminate on my own a lot. And this was ruminate out loud with other people and make a lot of notes and just listen. Cause those were almost, they were almost like informal feasibility study interviews. Right. Yeah, I learned a lot about what people need. And so what comes next once we're into the building, just to get the renovation done. I mean, that's yeah. a big thing. So it's like a full roof. Because the roof leaks, it's full HVAC, it's electrical, it's plumbing, it's the whole works. Like everything's gonna get redone in that building. And then, you know, when I think about like what do I want people to feel when they come into the space, something I think about a lot. I want them to feel, first of all, that no idea is a dumb idea. Yes. You know, and that if you have an idea you want to see happen in our community, let's let's talk about it and figure out how we could start it. And so what's funny is even though I didn't start my vision in a small way, I want to create a space where everybody else can. So like we're going to have a rotating storefront. And by rotating, it simply means that it'll be short-term lease. Yeah, like, a, so it's like, like an indoor pop-up. Totally, yeah. I want to give people, especially people that are making things, Makers uh, are home. They are an opportunity to show us what they're capable of, teach us a class if they want to. That's what I, I just get. I get super excited about featuring artists, featuring makers, and creating new things together and trying a lot of stuff, knowing that the outcome isn't necessarily what matters, but it's what we learned while we were trying all these different things. Oh my gosh. It sounds so fun. And it really sounds like a place I would love to go. And I'm sure most of the people listening, but let's say, let's say we don't live in Oaks. Yeah. Let's say we just live in Southeast North Dakota where growing small towns makes sense. Tell us about like the building that we're talking about. Right. The yep. organization. Why are you here? What are you doing? Yeah. So our nonprofit is not just a building. That is a really important distinction. The building is just the space for the, the stuff to happen. And so we actually serve seven counties in Southeast North Dakota. And the goal is to partner up and link arms with someone with their boots on the ground in every, in every community that wants to participate. This is, I always say to all of them, like, this is not a committee because I don't want anybody to feel strong armed or forced into giving time to this. It's something that if you participate, we're going to add value back to you. So what we're hoping to do, we're working right now on a survey and it's the coolest survey. Let me just say it's so neat where we're asking people that live in our communities. We'll be deploying it to all of the communities where there's like a, a representative right now. Um, okay. Got nine people on our working group. So nine communities throughout this seven county region are going to be able to ask their community members, people that live in their town, specific questions about human capital, which I just don't know that people are asking because I think traditional economic development is like infrastructure and specific business attraction and, you know, financial resources. And we're saying, what about the people? Mm. What about the average person that just lives in our community? What do they need? What do they want? So our intention is to host different kinds of events, programming. We've got a lot of really great resource providers, like most places do, right? That are already doing cool things, programs that would speak really well to what we find out we need. So we want to bring them in and let them do their job. And it's good for them because they don't have to market it then. Yeah. You know, so it really is a collaborative approach to community development instead of each individual community trying to figure out how to make it work on their own. I mean, we we've talked a lot already about just some of the things we could do. So like Southeast North Dakota people, if you're listening to this, we talked about like doing specific tours for certain kinds of people, like 
quilters, like a quilting tour, (laughs) you know, like, are there places that a quilting group of women should travel throughout this seven county region and give them like a day to enjoy? Or you could do the same with gardeners or you could, right? And I go to every one of these days. I know, like just so fun. It it is. And right now we just say, we have a great quilt shop, which by the way, we do right here in Oaks. But that's just, we're just one town. If we can draw, we can actually draw. Tourism has to be kind of a thing and it's not so much of a thing for individual communities alone. Right. At least in this part of the state, right? So it's all about just ideas. And nobody can do it by themselves, but together yeah. we can, you know? Yes. That's why I'm, we work together. It's one of our values. Yes. No, yeah. I love it. And I love too that it, I mean, this is COVID. One of the things that it did is it kind of grounded literally like everyone. Right. Um, totally. And so something within driving distance that is in your community from a safety perspective is just amazing to be like, we can't do this anymore, but like, hey, we can participate in our direct community and we also know how we, we can get to know our neighbors so we can help support each other because right. everybody is going through stuff. Right. We'll have some virtual programming as well. It's not like everybody needs to come to Oaks. I mean, all the time. That's I, I can't wait till we can have some in-person events again. Like, of course, that's what we want to do. Right. But we will be able to offer some virtual programming as well. And, you know, our, we've got three key areas like of programming. One is about business and entrepreneurship. You know, how do we support the people that already have businesses or help new people launch? Right. And that's a big that is a big deal for small towns. And I think, you know, at least it's my my assertion that that's our way forward. Not attracting giant businesses anymore because, you know, who's going to work at these giant businesses? It's like. It's kind of the, out, it's a, not a, it's an outdated model, I would say, or it's just a traditional thing where it's like, how do we get the next smokestack, right? This to me is like, how do we get the next local cool little indie shop? That's what I get excited about. And that's the when stuff. You're talking, when you're talking business owner too, this doesn't have to mean someone who, you know, opens a bakery. You're talking about people who are like, you know what? I love making leather wallets on the weekends. How totally make that open to my community, right? So you're talking about- right. everybody that has, right, well, any of it. someone works remotely now as an accountant, how could mm-hmm. they yep. do independent accounting? Right. All right, so side hustles welcomed. Side hustles are welcomed, absolutely. I mean, I think that that's, that's, again, one of the cool things that we get to say, like we get to celebrate. And I think how cool is it gonna be for my community to say, like, we believe so much in the value of a side hustle that you can co-work here. Like, you know, yeah, you like, don't have to have, like, you don't have to, your business, if it's, if it's a service space or a product space, handmade, homemade, whatever business, Yep. that feels kind of like you were saying, like eating an elephant. So there's going to be people there to help you give you the spoon, chew right. on, cut it right. up. Well, and not just space, right. But the resources that they might need, like we, we intend to be a repository of that kind of stuff and just running a business can be super lonely. I mean, everybody knows that who's ever done it. We want to give people a way to, to feel less alone in that journey. So then that's, so that's the first pillar is that it is the general business and entrepreneurship side of, of human capital. Um, the second thing is arts and culture. Super important to me. I I don't think that, um, traditionally we, we like look to specific little councils to do that in our communities. And I think it is something that, should be accessible to all. It creates meaning for people. It can create a sense of belonging for people. And so as long as I'm affiliated with Growing Small Towns, I want that to be just kind of baked into who we are. Yes. That we're always pushing creativity as much as we can, doing things that are a little like out there maybe. Like I'm so, I'm so here for all of that. Like some of the best things I've ever experienced were things that I happened upon and was like, Oh my, like I had no idea. So I have an example. So this is a few years ago, somebody shared that they were going to have a belly dancing instructor come to the small town right near here. And I was like, belly dancing. I don't know how to, I don't know how to belly dance, but I called a couple friends and I said, I think we should go to this. And they said, yes. So we hopped in the car and we went over there and we got, I wish that I had known I was going to tell you the story. I could have brought out. So it's a little sarong. Scarf? With, it's a, like, with, with the coins. Yes. 
can't you just see me? I'm doing it. They can't see me. Yeah. But if you can imagine the little coins jingling. Yeah. I, and I've sometimes I put it on and I'm like, that's right. And she taught us like the hip movements yes. and stuff. It was so much fun. And then she's, she was a beautiful instructor. And so she would ask some questions again, those moments where something unlocks inside you and you almost get a little bit for <laughs> you know, cause you're like, okay, and I'm moving my body and this is what it means. And this is what it connects to. And I am all about the verklempt feeling, Nicole. I'm sure you know this. Like if I can get choked up or moved to the point of wanting to like where the lump in my throat happens, that's, <laughs> I want to like, I want to like live there. I love it. I get into, so by the way, BTW everyone, you don't have to cry when you come to growing small towns, but you may, Yes, it might happen. So arts and culture, huge thing to me. I just think, man, you know, COVID again was a thing where we were able to see how healing and how supportive arts arts really are to us, you know, from music to movies, if, you know, if that's what your family's thing is, just how important it really is. It's something that we always think of as a nice to have, but it's, to me, it's foundational. It's foundational to community. It's foundational to wholeness. So yes. arts and culture, big, big thing. And then the, then the third is back to my roots, it's personal development for people. So what kinds of skills and knowledge and abilities do people need to hone in themselves to show up better for themselves and their families and their various things that they're involved with? So those are the three pillars of programs for human capital. So how do we follow along? So obviously, like, it's going to be really exciting to see this building coming together, which is kind of be the physical representation in Oaks, right? The pilot city. Yeah. Um, What's going on? Let's say I am obsessed with wanting to see what kind of floor. Will there be shiplap? Will there be tractor parts? <laughs> How will will I- there be shiplap? Yeah. Um, okay, so we are going to, we're going to journal and document the journey on just two social media platforms right now. Facebook, which is just Growing Small Towns. Instagram, at Growing Small Towns. And right now the Instagram is like a brand new account. So you'll see one post and I am going to just tell you because you guys can all go out and look at it. It is the image of the front, the storefront, when it was the Ben Franklin with me holding it in front of the existing building today. So like, again, the honor, we honor our past, that value. The reason I chose that for our organization is I think sometimes when we come into a a space, especially a small community, and we think about what we want to change and how we want to innovate stuff, we just like bulldoze the people that gave their hearts and souls and lives to get us to where we are. And I I would rather us remind ourselves to thank them and to try to be more gentle and gracious when they struggle with the changes that we're throwing at them. Like, I just think there's a ton of work that needs to be done around this. You could call it generational. You know, I think that's, that's a part of it, but I just, somewhere in that building, I want it to actually physically say somewhere that we stand on the shoulders of the people that came before us. I love that. Because I just think that's like the beauty of small towns, right? Is that people have given their their lives and dedicated their lives to making it as beautiful as it is now. And now what I want to do is find the people that want to be those people 20 years yeah. from now. Like they've been cultivating the home. And if you think of like Greek mythology, like the goddess who was the keeper of the hearth, she literally was the one who kept the fire in it. Like just that whole idea of hospitality and that's kind of what you're looking for people to come see them as a whole person and I know we've talked about this personally with being you being a farmer's wife right Mm -hmm. and I'm sure a lot of the people listening might be married to farmers or be a farmer and when you have a job that's seasonal and when it's seasonal it's very heavy you Mm -hmm. have to have someone holding the line back at home right and you know a lot of people will see the work of the farming, but you don't always see the person that's making the home. Right. And right. even maybe seeing the farmer as a person, as a whole person, not just right. the person who grows the corn or whatever beautiful crop. And that's exactly so- it. Yeah. My big belief, I think, or hypothesis that I want to test out throughout this whole organization is, is how do we encourage stewardship of gifts? You know, it, when, when people are really seen and really valued for what they uniquely contribute, like, so let me just say, this is totally an organizational development thing. So when companies, companies, the best cultures at companies are the ones that have this figured out. 
like they know what people's individuals strengths really are. Right. And they, Mm -hmm. they career path them, if you will. And there's like air quotes around that to help them kind of figure out their next steps based on that set of skills. You know, we're not trying to force fit them into the next promotion. It's about what's the next step they could take in the organization that would help them grow the most and contribute back to us the most. I think, I don't think it's any different than a small town. It's just, it's hard to figure out who in a small town is going to be the person to, to drive that initiative forward. And I think through a lot of conversations, we can at least start to help people be seen differently. That's my hope. You know what I mean? But and community, every single person in a community, not only has a gift to show up and offer their community, but if they don't, that gift is missing. And so the idea that creating space for people to show up with their gifts is going to just make the community as a whole so, so much stronger. So yes, I'm absolutely obsessed. So I don't live in North Dakota, but I can follow you on Instagram. You can. I can comment on all your posts. And actually, if you are hearing this episode, whenever it is, whether it's October 2020 or January 2032, Please comment on that first picture, the one of Rebecca's thumb, you said? Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's my hand holding up a picture. Yeah, comment where you're from so we know here at Growing Small Towns and we can say hi back. And I think it's pretty cool to be able to keep track and see people coming together because as someone who has an online business, now a lot of people have online businesses. They do. They do. You hit this wall of feeling like, who am I talking to? Am I literally just staring in my camera talking to myself? I am also a mom of three kids, so I talk to myself all the time. It doesn't bother me too much. Um, (laughs) Sometimes just hearing, I'm here too, is so encouraging. So go comment on that picture where you're from. And it's growing small towns. That's what, the handle, in Instagram. Right? That's the handle. Yep. Yeah. At Sorry. Growing Small Towns. They'll find it. Yeah. And then I can follow along and comment. And that's a great way to share the message. If I'm in North Dakota, especially in Southeast North Dakota, mm-hmm. um, and I want to get involved, if I want to say like, I'm here for it, what can I do? So anybody listening can also sign up to get updates. So just basically, it's like join our newsletter, right? Where we'll share the best of, of what's happening. We'll keep everybody updated on what's going on. You know, on the website, there's like get involved. There's a get involved tab. So you can check that out and check out the different ways people can people can get involved. You know, I right now, we're hoping for like a May 1st, 2021 official launch of programming. I actually think that that's conservative. I'm really praying it's sooner than that. Um, And that all just depends on like how much more expensive lumber is going to get in this period of time. It's it's some insanity happening right now, but that's okay. Right. Cause we're in it. We're committed. And I think there's two other things I want to share before we wrap. One is that the next episode. So this is our inaugural, like first episode of the growing small towns show. The second episode I'm featuring two guys I was used to say they're like my work husbands, which is super scandalous because there's two of them. Um, But Eric and Jordan from the Rural Ideas Network, these guys and my organization's like collaboration and I'm like really linked up with them, but in the best way and not a creepy or inappropriate way, I promise. These guys are amazing. And what they are doing is I am the first location outside of Iowa to launch some of this stuff. And so um, the Rural Ideas Network is a huge part of, of the programming I get to like get out of the gate with, which is really cool. So make sure you listen to the next episode because I'm going to have them on and we're going to talk all about it. So that was one thing. And the second thing is, you know, of everything we've talked about today, like the biggest thing I want people to know is that this space is for all of us. Yes. It truly is meant to be you know, like you have something you want to see happen, bring it to us. Let's talk about it here and figure out how we can start it. Because ultimately after over a year of work on this thing, what I have always believed to be true is that I can't, I can't sit around and wait for somebody else to do the thing I want to see happen. You know, you don't, you don't have to do it the way I did it, but if you, if you really want something in your small town, Quit waiting around for someone else to figure it out. Like, try something. 
I mean, there are, there are a lot of ideas of how to start small and I encourage that, but just start. Right. So you're saying someone has an idea. You will help them make their sticker chart. I will help them make their sticker chart. Absolutely. I will speak my elementary education. Yes. Language. Yes. So we're here to help you with your sticker charts. We got this. We got this. Um, So that was the first thing you wanted to make sure people knew. Listen to the next episode. Yeah. Um, And if you're worried about missing it, you can always for sure follow on Instagram and Facebook and we'll for sure let you know. Mm -hmm. What's the other thing you want to make sure we know? Um, So that was the second thing was that uh, this organization belongs to all of us. So those are the two things, right? And I am keeping my heart and my mind open to all things that might come my way. And when I've talked about who I want to collaborate with, those were my two prerequisites. You have to have an open mind and an open heart. And I know that sounds really soft, but I simply mean that you, yeah. we know that a lot of stuff has been tried in the past. I, I know that, but different times and different people can create a, a different context. So we sometimes need to revisit old ideas and try them again, right? Like I just, I don't ever want the thing to come out of our mouth to immediately be no, or that's not going to work, or we've never done that before. Therefore, we're not going to try it. Right. I, I want us to stay expansive in the way that we think about the future. I think that is like the perfect place to wrap this up. I cannot wait to see what happens with growing small towns due to the price of lumber. I understand if shiplap isn't going to happen. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, I will keep you posted on all things shiplap. I promise. And wallpaper. I'm actually personally really holding out for some cool wallpaper. My mom and I are working on that. Wallpaper will likely be in the space somewhere, somehow. Please be in the bathroom. We are down. Epic photos. Down with fun wallpaper. All right. Well, Rebecca, thanks for being on your show today. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, friend. You are such a dear, you're such a dear friend to me. I love you so much. I appreciate you coming on and helping us launch this baby. Oh, yeah. Well, and I'm happy to be on the board and I mean I'm in North Carolina so still in north of you like your other state so you're you're still the better of the Carolinas just like we're the better of the Dakotas just kidding South Dakota friends I love you I really do <laughs> yeah so I love I'm excited that I get to be involved from afar and just kind of see how this continues to grow and follow along all right thanks so much friends my gosh, so much fun. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Growing Small Town Show. We hope you found value in hearing the journey of our little nonprofit that could and all we've done so far. And we really hope that it inspires you to put into practice some of the things that we're learning through building this big dream of ours here. If you want to hear my answers to Nicole's fun and random questions, enter your email at growingsmalltowns.org forward slash fast five. We also will happily send you the latest and greatest of what's working in small towns when you enter your email address. Plus, if you want to continue the conversation outside of the podcast, we also invite you to join our Facebook group at growingsmalltowns.group. We cannot wait to see you again. In the meantime, get out there and keep on growing. We will see you next time. Bye.